So uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I'm on, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I'd also like to recite a little bit of verse for you. So, we'll all take a moment and just close our eyes. Oh, you, whose eyes are clear, whose eyes are friendly, whose eyes betray distinguished wisdom knowledge, whose eyes are pitiful, whose eyes are pure. Oh, you so lovable, with beautiful face, with beautiful eyes. When I first heard these verses, uh, I was really struck because I hadn't realized that um, Buddhas could be beautiful uh, and that you could, you know, feel attracted to them. Uh, and, and for me, when I heard these verses, I, I got a very clear um, image of, of that face and those eyes in front of me. And it really was like, love at first sight and I feel like I've um, I've been in love ever since so um, these lines are from the White Lotus Sutra uh, which is known also in uh, Sanskrit as the Siddharma Pundarika Sutra um, and the lines are spoken by one Bodhisattva to another Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. But I'll take a, I'll take a step back. Um, first of all, what even is a Bodhisattva? Um, it's made up of two Sanskrit words. So Bodhi means to be awake and Sattva is a being. So a Bodhisattva is uh, any being that is fully awake, fully enlightened and, and free of suffering. Um, this is very similar, of course, to a Buddha. Uh, that word is also from the Sanskrit root, to be awake. So we have the question, what's the difference between a Buddha and a Bodhisattva? Uh, this is actually quite a contentious question. Uh, it has a lot of historical and even political background, so I'm not gonna go into it now. For tonight, I'll say that uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are the same thing. They're both perfectly enlightened beings. Um, so the next question is, if that's what a bodhisattva is, why do we even need them? Some people will say, I have the word of the historical Buddha, I know how to meditate, just sit down and get on with it, what more do I need? And that's a, you know, a completely legitimate way of practicing, if that works for you, then that's definitely fine. Uh, there are other people, myself included, who find that Myths and images and stories are a very effective means of communication because I find that they just, they bypass my intellect altogether and go straight to the heart of me, which after all, that's where practice needs to happen. So for me, uh, myths and images are a very effective way of communicating the Dharma. So, because of that, bodhisattvas become very important to my practice. They become pivotal. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about one particular bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara. Uh, and we only have a short time tonight, so my, my introduction is going to be very, very brief. There is a hell of a lot you can say about him. Um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. But also I wanted to say this is a topic that I love and I also love questions. So if you ever want to get in touch with me personally and talk more about it, I would be delighted. So that's an open invitation. So yes, tonight I'm introducing Avalokiteshvara, which is quite a mouthful. It's made up of three Sanskrit words. Ava means down, Lokita is looked, and Ishvara is Lord. So poetically, 
you could describe, you could translate his name as the Lord who looks down on the world and sees and hears our suffering with compassion. Now, all enlightened beings will have certain attributes. For example, um, generosity, fearlessness, um, wisdom, and yet, in Buddhist iconography, each archetype tends to be associated with one particular aspect of enlightenment. So Avalokiteshvara is specifically described as the Bodhisattva of compassion. And normally, when you see pictures of him, he will be white, because white is a symbol of perfection. So in the same way that a beam of white light, when it hits a prism, will be refracted into the whole spectrum. So all the, all the qualities of Buddhas are perfected in Avalokiteshvara. Um, and he's also described as being miraculously beautiful. So, <laughs> so what do we make of this? There's two different ways perhaps of approaching it. So for instance, um, one way of looking at it is that beauty requires no justification. It's valuable in and of itself. Um, and the founder of our movement, Sangharakshita, uh, has talked about the mandala of uselessness. Um, and he goes into this in some depth. It's, it's a very profound teaching. Um, and I would say if you're not familiar with it yet, that's something you might like to read more about and look up. So that's one approach, that, that beauty is valuable in and of itself for no other reason than that. Uh, another way of looking at things is that um, beauty is very, very purposeful. Um, that it, there's actually a teaching in, in his beauty. So I would suggest that Avalokiteshvara is so attractive because he wants us to fall in love with him. Uh, he wants us to fall in love with the Dharma because when we are in love, all of our thoughts and energy and time goes into our beloved. So if we can practice this way, um, you know, with all of our hearts, with complete devotion, this is a very effective way of making progress. The attribute of Alokiteshvara um, with the, the magic of fascination which I think is a slightly more polite way of saying the same thing. Mm. And he also appears as, um, as a prince. He's bedecked in jewels and silks and all sorts of precious substances. Um, and again, you could say this is just another facet of his beauty and it's valuable just as it is. Um, or it's also been described as all this wealth is the spontaneous product of his ethical conduct. Um, and I think there's a teaching in that as well, because I think all of us have experienced that, that if somebody um, is very good to us, if somebody is ethical, then they appear beautiful, regardless of their objective appearance. You know, if, um, if you can be generous to the people around you, then they will love you quite naturally. So again, this, this beauty and this bounty that he's adorned with, I think is, is a lesson for us. Um, now, Avalokiteshvara is a very prominent bodhisattva. He's a very important figure, especially in Tibet. Um, and like other prominent archetypal figures, he's said to have 108 manifestations. Now, 108 is traditionally an auspicious number. If you have um, a rosary or a prayer beads, you'll notice that a long string has 108 beads for the same reason. Uh, in my years of research, which are admittedly not exhaustive, I have myself found about dif uh, 50 different forms, which are very varied and wide ranging. Um, I'll quickly just take you through some of the most important ones. Um, so the first one that I will tell you about is the, the Tibetan uh, form where his name is Chen Rezi. And this is, I'm sorry, can I go across? 
Um, this is a translation of his Sanskrit name, which means looking with clear eyes. Um, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama is considered to be the physical manifestation of Chenrezig. Um, now, I find this personally very reassuring because to me, it's, it means that bodhisattvas are not just abstract concepts. They're not just something that someone thought up. They actually exist in the world. They are here amongst us, helping us uh, and being kind in very um, practical ways. And that has been my personal experience. I definitely feel their presence in my life. Another very important and widespread um, manifestation is from China uh, and has spread throughout East Asia. And this is Kuan Yin, again, a translation of the Sanskrit name, see here. Uh, and what's really important about Kuan Yin is that she is female. So any enlightened being will necessarily have transcended the binary of, of gender and sex. And yet when you see most Buddhas depicted, they look very distinctly male. So to me, it's very, um, it's very exciting and reassuring to see that Avalokiteshvara is not, has not just transcended gender in, in theory, but very much in practice. Kuan Yin is not just some footnote. She is a very, very widespread and, and widely recognized figure, especially in East Asia. Um, and, and yeah, certainly um, in those areas, she's better known than the, the male version. So she's very important, yes. Um, now, because Avalokiteshvara has so many forms. You will see him in a variety of uh, postures with a variety of arms. One of the most common pictures that you'll see of him um, will feature four arms, as you can see here. So in one hand, he's holding a lotus. In another hand, he is holding again a crystal mala. Um, his prayer beads, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then in his central two hands, he's holding Chintamani, which is the wish fulfilling gem. So in Hindu folklore, Chintamani is very similar to the genie in the bottle. So it's something that just gives you whatever you want. But from the Buddhist perspective, it's a bit more interesting than that because as we know from the Buddha's teachings, the deepest satisfaction comes from having no wishes to begin with, or at least if you have craving to be able to hold that lightly. So here we have the paradox that Chintamani grants your wishes by alleviating you, alleviating wishes to begin with. And this is a sort of the paradox, the kind of uh, wisdom that Avalokiteshvara is holding to his heart. So I think, again, that's a very important symbol. Uh, another version of Avalokiteshvara that you might be familiar with, uh, that is quite commonly depicted, is, uh, has a thousand arms. So there's a story as to how this came about. So, one of the defining characteristics of bodhisattvas is that they make a vow. So Avalokiteshvara made the vow that he would help all beings to attain enlightenment and be free from suffering. But then he added, if I should doubt my ability to fulfill this vow, uh, if I should stop helping, then may my body burst into pieces, may my head explode. Yeah, so. So he takes up his crystal mala and he begins chanting his mantra. And with every bead that passes through his fingers, another being becomes enlightened, is freed from the rounds of rebirth. Uh, and he does this with great vigor. Um, and then there comes the point where he does a meditation of restitution and then he takes stock. So he looks to see how many beings he has helped. Uh, and the number that are now freed are countless. 
very good. Then he looks at the number of beings still to come, those still trapped in suffering. And he sees that amount of beings is completely numberless. And this is where he pauses and he doubts his ability to fulfill his vow. And then in keeping with that vow, he explodes into pieces and his head splits open and he cries out in anguish. So the moment he cries out, help is instantly at hand. And um, help comes in the form of the Buddha Amitabha. Amitabha is this Buddha here behind me. Uh, his name is made up of two parts. Amida means infinite or measureless and Abha is light. So he's the Buddha of infinite light. He's also the Buddha of love, of meditation and of sunset. So the moment he hears Avalokiteshvara's cry, he rushes over and helps him and he pieces Avalokiteshvara back together. Now he gives him a head to look in every direction. And traditionally, space is described as having 10 directions. So Avalokiteshvara now has 10 heads. And then Amitabha takes his own head and puts it right at the very top. So often when you see Avalokiteshvara depicted in paintings, you will see that Amitabha is sitting right there in his top knot like a guru. So now he has heads to look in all directions. But then, Avalok uh, then Amitabha gives him also a thousand arms to be able to help all beings. And, but that's not enough because he also, in the palm of every hand, he gives Avalokiteshvara an eye. And this is a symbol of the fact that wisdom and compassion are not separate. They're the same thing. And even that isn't enough. He gives Avalokiteshvara an implement in every hand, something helpful, a skillful means. So now Avalokiteshvara is even better able to fulfill his vow than he was at the start. And, you know, this is... This is a pretty epic sort of, <laughs> a pretty epic sort of mythical story. But I think actually there is a lot that we can relate to as practitioners. You know, we also begin as Buddhists with this lofty aspiration, perhaps the most lofty aspiration there is. And we begin with great vigor. But sooner or later, I think we all experience doubt. Um, and I know from my own experience that when I am in the depths of despair. Sometimes it does feel too much for my body, like I'm going to explode. Um, so I can very much relate to this image of, of Avalokiteshvara bursting. But it's important that the story doesn't end there because this is not about, you know, pointless despair. Um, because what happens then is that he asks for help and it comes in the form of love. And I think sometimes uh, I've had teachers tell me in meditation that, you know, loving kindness is not something that we have to forcibly generate uh, in ourselves, that loving kindness that exists already in the world, in the fabric of reality. Uh, and all we have to do is open up to it and allow it in to ask for it and it will be there so again this is a very important image that if you do ask for help it is immediately available you just have to be receptive to that uh, and then of course having gone through this whole process of aspiring and putting in great effort and despairing asking for help and receiving help Avalokiteshvara now is better able to help others, to help all beings. And I think that's, that's true of, of us as well. Having gone through that entire process makes us better able to empathize. And when somebody does ask us for help, we can respond with something closer to compassion than we otherwise might have. Mm. Um, so, this story really is ultimately a story of spiritual friendship, uh, which I think is, you know, pivotal. One of the markers of our um, movement, something that 
uh, Raksha has really emphasized. And he's also specifically chosen thousand armed Avalokiteshvara to be the symbol of our order because he described his vision as every order member being like an arm or a hand of Avalokiteshvara um, being active in the world. And it's interesting, you know, that every hand holds a different implement. Like each of us brings our own unique strengths and abilities uh, in, into our activity in the world. So it's a very apt image. There is yet another possible interpretation of these thousand arms, this image. Um, I sometimes hear it said that you can tell how powerful a god is by the number of hands that they have, the number of arms they have. So it's immediately clear which god is better than which other god. And then I thought, you know, a thousand arms, that is completely beyond the pale. That's, that's like having infinite arms, really. And I really like the way that that sort of just does away with this whole petty sort of ego-driven competition about who is more worthy than who. Really, compassion is the most powerful thing, the most helpful thing, and everything else is, is really not helpful in comparison. So that's another lovely way of looking at the symbol of the thousand arms. Now, if you will let me be a little bit creative, I would also like to draw a lineage. So if we start with Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha who gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, um, one way of understanding the Buddha's archetypes they are um, expressions of different facets of Shakyamuni's experience of the enlightened mind. So, for example, Amitabha is the Buddha of love. So we see that the enlightened mind is a loving mind. And the story goes that uh, Amitabha was deep in meditation and he opened his eyes and light flooded out of his eyes and it coalesced into the form of other uh, And then there is another story that Avalokiteshvara gives rise to another Bodhisattva in turn. So again, Avalokiteshvara is perceiving the suffering going on in the world. And he's so moved by our suffering that he begins to weep. And with all these tears, a lake forms. And this is actually uh, said to be Lake Otang in Lhasa in Tibet. So you can actually go there and have a look. Um, but again, the story doesn't end with useless despair. Because out of this lake comes an enormous blue lotus. And it opens up. And there, sitting at the center, is a princess. Um, and she is the Bodhisattva of compassion in action. So her name is Green Tara. Again, she's a very important figure, very prominent in Tibet. Uh, and there's an enormous amount that can be said about her. But I'll just, I'll just mention one thing. Normally, the Buddhas, when they're seated in meditation, uh, they have their feet folded up in the full lotus position. But Green Tara has one leg extending as if she's about to jump up from her seat and engage with the world and help you. Um, so we see that this idea of a lineage comes with um, the teaching that you have Shakyamuni who attains enlightenment under the tree. The enlightened mind is a loving mind. From the loving mind comes compassion and compassion manifests as action in the world. So I think this really tells us something about what we can aspire to as practitioners. What does it look like? What is, what is love? It's, it's love, it's you know, feeling for other beings. It manifests as action. This is how we can practice. This is how we can attain enlightenment. So I think that's also a, a very practical teaching for all of us. The night is getting on, so I will, uh, I'll
I'll just tell you one more story. And this is about Avalokiteshvara's mantra. Um, now, because Avalokiteshvara himself is such a widespread and important figure, his mantra is also very widely chanted and practiced. Um, and I would say it's probably one of the two most widely chanted mantras in the Buddhist world. So where does this mantra come from? Um, Avalokiteshvara appears in very many sutras, especially the later Mahayana sutras. But there is one in particular that is specifically about him, and that is the Baskets Display Sutra, the Karanda Yuha. Uh, and this is basically, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the story of Avalokiteshvara's adventures throughout the universes, helping all sorts of different beings in all sorts of different ways. And it's quite a, it's quite a rollicking tale, actually. So, but there's one episode that I'll tell you about. So, there's a particular bodhisattva, and his name is 10 syllables long, so I will spare you that. But he goes and sees Shakyamuni, uh, the historical Buddha. And this bodhisattva says, can you tell me about Avalokiteshvara? I've heard so much about him. Shakyamuni goes on at great length talking about the benefits to be gained from chanting Avalokiteshvara's uh, mantra. So he speaks at great length and at the end the Bodhisattva says, yeah, that's, that's fabulous stuff, I really like that, but I'm thirsty for the Dharma, so it's not enough for me to hear about the benefits of practice. I actually want to take up the practice myself, so can you tell me what the mantra is? And Shakyamuni says, you know, actually, I can't, um, but I can tell you who can. There is this preacher, and he lives in such and such a place, and the Bodhisattva is like, right, okay, I'm off. No, 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 wait, wait, before you go, I should warn you. And now I'm going to quote directly from the sutra. This preacher has broken his monastic vows. His conduct is poor, and his behavior is poor. His orange robes are filled with feces and urine. He has not followed the noble path. So again, here there is a teaching uh, that really, sometimes the, the most important teachers in our lives are the people that we feel the strongest aversion to, um, that we perhaps even hold in contempt or look down on. People yeah, who we think could do better, often have the greatest treasures for us. So I think that's, um, that's a bit of a pointed lesson right there. Anyway, so this Bodhisattva has heard this warning, not daunted, off he goes. And he, uh, he traverses the universe, goes through all sorts of trials and adventures to finally find this preacher. So he finally gets there and he says, is it true that you have the mantra? And the preacher says, yes, I do. Will you give it to us? And the preacher said, well, in the presence of this Bodhisattva, in the presence of these heavenly hosts of, of, of gods and spirits, and everyone has arrived here to ask for this mantra. And the preacher's like, I don't know, maybe not. And he, he's umming and eyeing and everyone is on the edge of their seats and he can't decide whether to tell them. And then finally, the voice of Avalokiteshvara sounds from the sky and says, listen, preacher, this Bodhisattva has gone through really bad trials to get here. He has traveled unimaginable distances to hear this mantra. So give it to him, all right? The preacher's like, all right, I'll give him the mantra. And the mantra is, Om Mani Padme Hum. Yeah. Now, lots, uh, what is a mantra anyway? So a mantra can be described as protecting the mind. It is uh, the sound manifestation of an archetype. Um, it can be described as an invocation or even as a magic spell. Um, and many mantras cannot really be translated. They don't actually have a coherent meaning. But this particular mantra can. Um, now, I, for one, 
found it very helpful to find out what the literal meaning of the mantra was. Um, I think it's a very beautiful image uh, that I found very inspiring and uh, that helps in my practice, definitely. On the other hand, there are people who very strongly feel that the power of mantra comes, again, from, from not being able to understand it intellectually. So uh, out of respect for those people, in case there's any, anyone like that in the audience, I'm not going to tell you what the mantra means. Um, there are plentiful resources online if you want to look it up. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has himself uh, spoken many times about what the mantra means. Um, and also, if you're interested in this sort of thing, there is a fabulous website called um, visiblemantra.org. Um, and there, I think it's actually run by one of our order members. There he goes into great detail about the meaning of mantra, what the different mantras are for different beings, uh, how to write them in different scripts, that sort of thing. So I'd recommend that if you're interested. Um, another thing that he talks about on this website is the bija of each figure. Now, bija is the Sanskrit word for seed. And here the idea is that it's the seed syllable written on an archetype's heart. So uh, you could say that the bija really is the condensed essence of the whole mantra. And at this point in the talk, you won't be surprised to know that Avalokiteshvara has the same bija as Amitabha. They share the same one. And I will translate it for you because this is important. Um, their bija is the word hri. Now, hri can be translated as remorse. And it's very important to say that remorse is not guilt. And it is not self-recrimination or self-hatred or shame, or any of those things. Remorse is um, very clearly described as a positive mental state in the Abhidharma. And it's, it's kind of the feeling of knowing that you could do better and wanting to do better. So really, it is the source of all positive emotion. It's the source of skillful volition. Um, it's the source of ethics, really. So it's a very fundamental um, experience for us as practitioners. Um, and I mean, look, it can be very painful to experience knowing that you could have done better and you wish you had done better. It's not, it's not always fun, but it is ultimately so positive. It's, it's um, such an important spiritual step. So I will leave you with one final image to, uh, to reflect on. And that is that Hri is written on the heart of Amitabha, the Buddha of love, and also on the Bodhisattva of compassion. That this idea that love and compassion and remorse all exist in the same heart. I think that's quite a, a poignant image. And I've said a lot tonight in quite a short space of time. So I'll just finish with everything that I've said in mind. I'll just finish with the verses of praise again. So we close our eyes the last time. Oh, you whose eyes are clear, whose eyes are friendly, whose eyes betray distinguished wisdom knowledge, whose eyes are pitiful, whose eyes are pure. Oh, you so lovable, with beautiful face, with beautiful eyes.